Hey guys, welcome back to another True Crime Thursday. Today I'm going to be talking about the disappearance and murder of Ruth Kruger. This is a story that happened in the early 1900s and is evidence of how police really used to suck. <laughs> so sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy. Ruth Kruger was a pretty 18-year-old brunette who had just graduated in a midwinter ceremony from Wadley High School for Girls on West 114th Street. Her father, Henry, a bus company executive, said that she held the promise of a magnificent womanhood before her. On February 13, 1917, Ruth walked away from her family's Claremont Avenue apartment in Morningside Heights with a pair of ice skates over her shoulder. She was wearing a blue velvet coat, a black hat adorned with a flowered ribbon, white kid gloves, and her new graduation ring from Wadley High School. Bundled up against the cold, Ruth's destination was a grimy motorcycle repair shop at 524th West, 127th Street, where a sign hung in the window saying, Skates Sharpened. The teen's family grew concerned when she had not returned by dinner time. Henry phoned the two nearest police stations on West 125th and West 100th to report his daughter missing, but neither of them did anything because by policy they are not allowed to investigate missing person cases until they have been gone for 24 hours. At midnight, as concern grew to high levels, they decided that they couldn't just wait 24 hours. So family friends, Alfred and Alma Brown, marched into the Old Fourth Branch Detective Bureau and demanded that the cops search uh, hospitals, morgues, and jails for Ruth. A detective sergeant, John Legarin, lectured Kruger's family, saying that 99 out of 100 missing persons eventually turn up. Legarin, 37 at the time, was an 11-year veteran and the NYPD's newly appointed expert on the missing. He suggested that Ruth was on the prowl, unthinkable to her father, as she had high morals and good standards and she wasn't just some girl that was going to go off and do some unthinkable things. Ruth's older sister, Helen, did the cop's job the following day. She remembered that Ruth had told her she was going to go get her skates sharpened at a specific shop. So Helen decided to investigate. She went to the shop at 9.30 a.m. and found it closed. She returned an hour later to find a padlock on the door. Finally, at around 2.30 p.m., the business was open. She made her way inside to find people wanting to get baby carriages repaired and a man hunched over a bicycle. The owner, Alfred Kochi, about 35, said that Ruth had dropped off her skates and came back later in the afternoon to pick them up. End of story. But Helen's intuition told her that Kochi wasn't telling the entire truth, so she ran back to her father to tell him of what she had learned. Henry urgently phoned Sergeant Legarine with the name of perhaps the last person to have seen Ruth alive, but Legarine dismissed Helen's snooping. He vouched for Kochi, saying that he was a respectable businessman and a buddy boy of the NYPD's new motorcycle squad, founded in 1911. Henry appealed to the higher-ups and begrudgingly sent a snitty legarine to the motorcycle shop to look in the basement. The sluice report totaled four words. I searched the cellar. That's it. Didn't give any information of what he looked at, what he did. He's an ass. <laughs> the New York Police Department seemed content on letting the case just grow cold, give up on it, but Ruth became a national fixation. The victim's profile, young, white, attractive, and from a respectable family, revived interest in the idea of white slavery. It's really not a great name for that. <laughs> the idea that thousands of girls who vanished every year in New York and other large cities had one way or another entered the sporting life or prostitution. After a sensational 1907 case in Chicago, a frenzy over white slavery erupted. Americans lived in a state of fear equivalent to the bomb scares of the 1950s. Newspapers printed daily agony columns mi listing the names of missing girls. Most reformers harbored nativism sentiment and warned that the large influx of immigrants, particularly those from Southern and Eastern Europe, were changing the character of the country. They argued that such men, specifically Greeks, Italians, and Jews, acted as panderers in the red light districts, organizing the kidnapping, rape, and sale of young girls. The white slavery phenomenon 
peaked in June 1910, when Congress passed and President William Howard Taft signed the White Slave Act, better known as the Mann Act. The Mann Act forbade the interstate transport of women for immoral purposes without specifying the exact meaning of the phrase which ultimately allowed the government to investigate anyone it found objectionable for any reason. The advance of the automobile changed the business of prostitution. More sporting girls made house calls, and red light districts across the country began to diminish. Public opinion shifted as well. Prostitutes were no longer considered victims, but simple-minded girls of questionable character and dubious acquaintance. The New York Police Department suggested that Ruth fit this profile and that she wanted to be lost and had gone into this sporting life. One witness spotted a girl matching Ruth's description getting into a taxi with an unidentified man. Another suspect, whose name was never released, was believed to have met Miss Kruger several times without her parents' knowledge. But there's no evidence of that, is there? Meanwhile, Alfredo Cochi fled back to his native Italy and escape the Kruger family suspected was aided by police. Exasperated, Henry posted a $1,000, roughly $20,000 today, reward for information about the case and hired a lawyer turned investigator, Grace Humston, who had gained notoriety the previous year by battling to save the life of a man on Sing Sing's death row. She would eventually prove that he had been convicted on falsified evidence and secured his release. Before that, she had gone undercover and infiltrated turpentine camps in the South where she discovered families working under slave labor conditions. At age 46, with black hair coiled into a bun and the tendency to speak sotto voice, Humston seemed more like a librarian than any type of investigator. When a reporter for the New York Times visited her office at Madison Avenue and 42nd Street, she was on the phone with her mother asking if she could water her plants. It was like dropping in at Baker Street and having Holmes throw the pipe, the violin, and the hypodermic out of the window and begin to discuss how many strawberries made a shortcake. Frankly, so far as appearances go, Miss Humston is badly miscast in the role of sleuth extraordinary, or as the program might say, Miss Sherlock Holmes. Simpson spent 15 hours a day on the case, working pro bono, interviewing Harlem residents who might have any information of what happened to Ruth. One man recalled seeing Kochi emerge from his basement around midnight on February 13th, covered in dirt and appearing nervous. Another spotted Kochi the following night, again dirty, and nervous. On this evidence, Humston went to Kochi's shop, determined to get into the cellar. Kochi's wife appeared holding a brick. I'll split your skull with this brick if you try and come in here, she said. Humston reported the threat to police commissioner Arthur Woods, who granted her a search permit, which I don't know if that's even legal, but he did. <laughs> On June 16th, she enlisted the help of Patrick Solom, a close friend of the Kruger family, and the general foreman for Grand Central Terminal. Solom started in the main basement room directly beneath the shop. A cluster of benches, toolboxes, and chests of drawers created a triangular work area. Solemn noticed that one chest along the southeast corner of the room slanted slightly, protruding an inch below the others. He asked two assistants to help him. They discovered that the concrete floor beneath had been smashed with a hatchet or axe and then sliced with a saw. They took turns digging, removing layers of ashes, cinders, dirt, and chunks of concrete. Farther down, embedded in the dirt, they found a pair of dark trousers with pinstripes and stains. And beneath that, a large sheet of rubber, carefully arranged to prevent any odor from escaping. Weird. Three feet down, the pit sloped to the west. A shovel struck something hard. And after a little more digging, they realized it was a protruding hip bone. They pulled the body up inch by inch and swept away the dirt. A piece of hemp rope nine feet long was knotted tightly around the ankles, cutting into the flesh. A towel looped around the neck. The feet bore shoes and stockings, both brown, and the blue of a velvet coat had faded to slate. Kid gloves concealed the hands, and a black hat lay smashed deep inside the pit. The final discovery was a pair of ice skates, covered with mottled blood. The victim's skull had been crushed from behind above the left ear. Humston confirmed that the clothes were those worn by Ruth the day she had disappeared. She convinced Henry not to go into the basement. 
Good idea. And he later identified his daughter by the ring she was wearing, which was her graduation ring. An autopsy revealed a deep gash in Rupe's abdomen extending to her spine, carved with the blade of her own ice skate an injury that classified the case in parlance of the times as a ripper. Otto H. Schultz, medical assistant to the district attorney, determined that the killer inflicted the wound after the blow that crushed Ruth's skull, but while she was still alive. God, I hate people. Italian officials refused to extradite Alfredo Cochi, but he was arrested and confessed to the assault and murder of Ruth. I had never seen Ruth Kruger before she came to my shop to have her skates sharpened. From the very beginning, Ruth did all in her power to attract my attention. I felt something strange when her dark, penetrating eyes fixed on mine. I was still more disconcerted when she came back to get her skates. An overpowering attraction for the young woman seized me. What happened afterwards seems like a dream. He was sentenced to 27 years in prison. And more. But Grace Houston wasn't finished. She publicly accused the NYPD of negligence, and a subsequent investigation by Police Commissioner Woods revealed a long-standing, mutually beneficial relationship between Kochi and the department. Look at that. If an officer arrested someone for speeding, he would send the offender to Kochi, suggesting that the repairman was able to compromise cases for a small fee. Kochi would collect the fee, keep a portion for himself, and kick back the rest to the officer. Next, Grace gave a series of interviews intended both to rehabilitate Ruth's character and lay the groundwork for the next phase of her own career. I started out with the conviction that Ruth Kruger was a good girl. I knew that one of her training and character never would figure in an elopement of anything of that kind. Working on this conviction of mine, I knew that the police theory of waywardness was all bosh. She suggested that Kochi had intended to force Kruger into prostitution and urged the city to renew its efforts against white slavery. What I think is needed is a bureau that would prevent girls from getting into the hands of these beasts, rescue them if they were already snared, and then cure them of their moral ailment. Do you know that no girl of the streets, if rescued before she reaches the age of 25, ever continues her shameful trade? In July 1917, Grace was named a special investigator to the New York City Police Department, charged with tracing missing girls and uncovering evidence of white slave traffic. At the same time, she formed the Morality League of America, a throwback to the anti-vice organizations prevalent in the years leading to the passage of the Mann Act. Hundreds of families sought her to help in locating their missing daughters and sisters. The Kruger murder brought Grace national renown, but she, along with scores of other prominent progressive era reformers, were eventually lost to history. Later, newspaper recollections of the Kruger case removed Grace Houston entirely. If it weren't for her, Ruth may still be trapped away in that basement. And luckily, to this day, this case is solved. <laughs> To conclude, I'm happy that this case is solved. Ruth was found. Not a great fate. She just wanted to have her ice skate sharpened. She was an 18 year old who had recently graduated from high school and she was like in just having a good day. And then a guy's like, ooh, she's really pretty. She looked at me, ooh, and then murders her with her own ice skate, which is just horrible. And then buried her in the basement. Now her family, was really concerned about her and wanted to find her. Now, the police policy is they have to wait 24 hours, which I think is honestly stupid because by then the person's probably dead. Really, that rule is stupid <laughs> and it should be uh, gotten rid of, in my personal opinion. And the family did more investigating work than the actual police. And Grace worked to help find Ruth without even getting paid. She spent 15 hours a day asking around seeing if she could figure out any evidence to where Ruth had gone. She was the one who got the permit to go into the building, and she was the one who helped find Ruth. The police should have done that. Instead, they sent a detective, who sucks, and is probably just as corrupt, and was hanging out with Kochi and being like, oh my god, give me money, and didn't even search. His report had four whole words in it. Are you fucking kidding me? And you know what sucks about it is that I looked it up and this guy had like a 40 year police career after this. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> he should have been fired on the spot. Instead, he continued to be a police officer, even though he was corrupt. Now, maybe he got better. 
In this story, he was in his 30s. Maybe after this case, he learned his lesson and got better. Or maybe he didn't. Of course, I don't know. But uh, in this story, he's a dink. And that's a fact. And I'm sorry that this had to happen to Ruth. I'm just glad that they found her. And uh, that this case is solved. I hope you guys enjoyed as much as you can enjoy a story like this. I'll be back again on Thursday with another True Crime Thursday and Monday with whatever I decide to post. Alright guys, I'll see you later.